Welcome to another episode of the Six P's podcast. Today we are focusing on Frank Darabont's film, The Shawshank Redemption, and we're going to look at film techniques as well as touch on symbolism. Let's start with the basics. And film techniques are what directors use to help tell the story, much like an author uses literary devices to tell their narrative. You'll remember that we've looked at things like metaphors and similes and personification, dialogue, imagery, all these literary devices which authors use to really bring their story to life. Well, directors do the same thing, but they use film techniques. What you're going to find is that many of the film techniques we look at today are used in most, if not every single film, and they often have added meaning for the audience. And I think you're going to remember many or most of these terms from previous years when we looked at other films. We'll start with a really easy one. This is a close up. It's when the camera is zoomed in on a character or an object and it's done in order to highlight a character's emotion or facial expression or their reaction to something that happens in the film. It provides the audience with a bit more of an insight into what they're thinking or feeling. In this particular scene that we have here, there is a close up of the rope that Andy is holding and the camera tilts up to a close up of his concerned face. This warns the audience that something dangerous is about to happen. And if you think about the lighting or the dim lighting used in this scene as well, it is quite foreboding. It's quite ominous. Now, this scene, of course, comes up later on in the film through the implementation of a flashback. So the first time we see this scene, we are very much concerned, much more concerned anyway, than the second time we watch this when we're much more intrigued, I guess you could say. Let's look at angled shots now. We'll start with a low angle shot. And this is when the camera shot is from below or underneath the character. And when we're looking up at another character, it makes them appear much more powerful. Throughout the Shawshank Redemption, Warden Norton is more often than not um, depicted with low angled shots because he appears more authoritative and powerful, particularly when talking to Andy in this case. It is shot from Andy's perspective, so we share his point of view when Warden Norton threatens him. Captain Hadley is another character, obviously, who is shot from low angles, once again to show his power. The opposite of a low angle shot is a high angle shot, and this is obviously a camera shot from above a character, which is used to make a character seem less powerful rather than more powerful. And we're going to use the same scene in which we saw Warden Norton last time. So there are high angle shots taken of Andy Dufresne. It makes him appear much more vulnerable and is obviously taken from Warden Norton's perspective. This particular scene is really important because it highlights or emphasizes the power differential, the power dynamic between Andy and Warden Norton. There's a clear imbalance between the two of them. And we definitely do feel sympathetic for Andy in this particular exchange. Let's look at the opposite of a close up, I guess you could say, and that is a long shot. This is a camera shot which pretty much depicts a character's full body, but particular focuses on the setting. In this case, we see Andy and he's surrounded by the prison buildings and the prison walls here. He is clearly trapped and enclosed by the vast and large size of the prison. It's almost like he's in a position that he can't escape from. He's suffocating. So once again, a long shot is depicted here to really showcase that. Let's look at the mise-en-scene now. This is a French word. It essentially means the shot composition. What do we see in, in a particular shot? What's in the foreground? What's in the background? It creates a sense of place, a sense of character and a mood as well. In this particular scene where Andy plays music to the other prisoners, we can see that the speaker is the main focus of the shot. This is used to emphasize the importance of the music for the prisoners and how it impacts every one of them. In fact, there's even a couple of guards there as well. 
So you'll notice the mise en scene, you'll notice the fact that it's a high angled shot as well as being a long shot too. So notice how they all work together to really elucidate or illustrate the importance of the music to the prisoners and the sense of freedom that they feel in this particular scene. Lighting is pretty straightforward. It can be natural lighting or it can be cinematic lighting as well. And in this case, in this particular scene, when Wharton Norton is talking to Tommy, you'll notice that the harsh light creates a shadow over part of his face, highlighting his shady side and the dangerous actions that he must take in regards to Tommy and Andy because he's really concerned. Lighting is, or dim lighting I should say, is used in a lot of horror films. Sort of bad things happen at night time. The classic horror films are often set at night time to really build that mood or really build that atmosphere. So in this case, this particular scene, yeah, lighting is really, really important. Now we've got diegetic sound. This is sound from within the world of the film, and we'll look at non-diegetic sound in a tick. But it essentially allows the audience to share in the sounds of the character's world. It really adds realism and authenticity. It places the audience in the particular setting. And we'll use the same scene we looked at before when it came to the mise-en-scene. In this scene, the audience hears the sound of the Mozart composition, including the harshness of the microphone that Andy uses. We pick up everything. Um, you notice that sometimes diegetic sound will morph into non-diegetic sound as well. That does happen in films too, but essentially diegetic sound is really the sound that the characters can hear. Let's look at non-diegetic sound now. So if diegetic sound is sound the characters can hear, then obviously non-diegetic sound is that in which characters cannot hear. It's added to the film. Essentially, non-diegetic sound is like a soundtrack. It adds more atmosphere and emotion to a particular scene. And this scene, I think, sums it up perfectly. Dramatic music is added to intensify the joy and relief that Andy feels, having just escaped from Shawshank Prison. And there's a real climax or a crescendo to when he finally takes off his prison uniform and he feels a rain on his skin. That sense of triumph and freedom that he feels is just emphasised by the non-diegetic sound that Frank Darabont has selected in this particular film. Um, so non-diegetic sound, again, just adds extra atmosphere and emotion to a scene. Now, of course, there are other film techniques which Frank Darabont uses. I've got another sort of 10 here, but it doesn't end here. And I definitely recommend that you go and do some extra research if you want to learn about this. We have flashbacks, particularly, or well, the scene that we looked at before is a, a sort of a flashback where Red, I think, is the one who narrates Andy's escape from the prison. And again, we've got voiceover and narration just underneath that. Red is the narrator in this particular film. He tracks Andy's life in Shawshank Prison. And it's a really interesting decision by the director, Frank Darabont, to have done that. He sort of provides the audience with some additional information about Andy's life in Shawshank, particularly when he first arrives. We've got zooming, and we looked at close-ups a little bit earlier, but obviously zooming in on a particular object or particular person to really, again, highlight its significance. You've got panning and tilting as well. So panning is from left to right or right to left, and tilting is up and down. You'll see props throughout the film. Um, you've got editing as well. So editing is obviously the sequence in which the shots are shown. You could even look at the Kuleshov effect there where a character will look at something, will get the shot of what they're looking at, and then will cut back to the character's face to see their reaction to whatever it is they are looking at. And that's shown throughout Shawshank Redemption for sure. You've got a bird's eye shot. You've got colour. I think colour is particularly important. You'll notice that life inside Shawshank is very dull and bland. And when Andy escapes, when he leaves, and when particularly that final scene is so full of colour, just emphasises the freedom. 
You've got the costuming as well as symbolism. And let's have a look at symbolism now, shall we? Symbols are what directors use to help tell a story much like film techniques. These also are featured in written texts as well, you'll find, and they have added meaning for the audience and motifs are symbols which appear continuously throughout the film. We're gonna look at a couple of symbols today. We're gonna to start with the bird. Birds represent freedom. They have the ability to fly and be free. Note how Brooks cares for Jake in a dark place like Shawshank as well. I think that's quite beautiful. And Jake uh, leaves or Brooks sort of lets Jake go just before he leaves. The bird sort of flies and is free. Um, there's almost a sense of hope for Jake, whereas unfortunately for Brooks, um, he doesn't have that same sense of hope. Life outside Shawshank isn't easy for him. So birds, yeah, again, freedom and hope is what they represent. And we've got a couple of quotes here. The first one from Red, who says, I have to remind myself that some birds aren't meant to be caged. Their feathers are just too bright. And when they fly away, the part of you that, that knows it was a sin to lock them up does rejoice. And that is in reference to Andy. And the second quote is from Brooks. He says, I can't take care of you no more. You go on now and you're free. We've also got the Bible as an interesting symbol. It's meant to represent moral values and principles and what is the right way to act, the Christian way to act. This is particularly ironic given Warden Norton's actions. What themes does this link to? Well, salvation and rehabilitation particularly. Warden Norton says that salvation lies within when he's first introduced to Andy Dufresne. That quote is actually ironic. It comes back to bite Warden Norton because this is what Andy writes in the Bible, which he leaves him. This is where he managed to um, hide uh, the tool he used to tunnel out of Shawshank, that rock axe. And there's that second quote. I believe in two things, discipline and the Bible. Here you'll receive both. Put your trust in the Lord. Your ass belongs to me. Great quote from Warden Norton. Notice how there's a shared um, understanding of the Bible as well between Warden Norton and Andy. That's sort of, Warden Norton trusts Andy because of that, which is quite interesting. And again, a little bit ironic because this ultimately um, is what brings him down. Of course, there are other symbols and I definitely encourage you to undertake some further research on these particular ones. You've got the music, which we looked at a little bit earlier. Of course, when Andy plays that song for the other prisoners, you've got the rock hammer. You've got Andy's posters of the female movie stars, which provides the audience with a bit of insight into the time period in which those scenes are set. You've got Raquel Welsh at the very end, um, but you've got Rita Hayworth at the start. Uh, Ward Norton's framed embroidery, we can see that to the right hand side. His judgment cometh in that right soon. It's of course behind that particular embroidery where he hides his corrupt books. And obviously there's a nice shot of this towards the end of the film. We get that zoom in. Um, obviously um, Ward Norton's judgment comes when the police come. The last one is of course the vast nature of the Pacific Ocean. It represents freedom. Um, the colour is particularly quite vivid in contrast to that from within the prison. And of course, we've got that great scene at the end of the film between Red and Andy when they meet up again. Now, film techniques are really important because we can use them in our essays as evidence. You can also, of course, use symbols in your essays as evidence. Um, obviously, apart from quotations as well, film techniques will just enable you to further strengthen your key ideas or your key points that you're trying to make in your essay. This is a bit of a template of a sentence that you might want to use. Of course, you might take sort of two sentences to describe a particular film technique. Um, Darabont uses, employs, utilizes, or implements the film technique to depict the particular example or the scene that you're going to use or even the character in order to highlight, emphasize, or illustrate, and then you can write your analysis in after that. Of course, there are many other verbs that you could use in terms of the explanation verb there. We've gone through those before, um, but those are three really nice verbs you might want to use. Let's have a look at an example, shall we? This is from a scene we looked at earlier on. 
The director utilizes high camera angles of Warden Norton when he threatens Andy with the hardest time there is to illustrate the power imbalance between the two characters. The concurrent low angle camera shots of Andy highlights his vulnerability and inability to escape Norton's corrupt and immoral reign. So in this case, we've actually used um, two film techniques. We've got high camera angles and the low angled shots as well. Again, you might want to play around with this sentence structure. You might want to bring in your own verbs. The main thing is you outline what the film technique is. You depict a particular scene where it's used and you analyze or explain how it sort of strengthens the point, the idea or the theme that you're trying to explore in your essay. But that's all from me today. If you have any questions, feel free to get in touch. Six P's podcast at gmail.com. And we'll see you next time on the Six P's podcast.